Okay, see I can see that. Can everyone else see that? Yes, yes. very well. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Well, uh, again, thank you very much for inviting my tax to this session. Um, we always appreciate the opportunity to talk about who we are and what we do. Uh, I hope that most of the folks online today are somewhat familiar with MyTax um, and who we are as an organization and what we do. Um, so we've, we've actually got um, two of us will be presenting today. Um, I will start off and give a little bit of an overview of MyTax, just who we are as an organization um, and what we do. And then specifically focus in on um, some of the programs that we run, well, the programs that we run that uh, where there is a specific eligibility for uh, postdoctoral scholars. Um, and then my colleague Valentina will talk about our the training and the training workshops that are available through my tax again for post postdocs. Um, and then, of course, we'd be happy to take questions at the at at the end of the presentation. Uh, Michelle uh, is going to kindly run operate the slides for us um, and also is here uh, as a resource when we get to that section uh, in terms of uh, Q&A. So Michelle, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, thank you. It's working. That's great. Love it when technology works. Um, okay, so so my tax is an organization. We are uh, we're very interesting organization and a very unique organization. We are national. We are independent. We're a not for profit organization, um, and we are de dedicated to fostering economic growth through innovation. Um, next slide, please. So we do this in a really unique way. Um, and and we really focus on 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 talent uh, and bringing the next generation of researchers and innovators um, that we know we need for Canada's knowledge and innovation based economy uh, to bring them together with industry. And when we say industry, I'm talking not just private sector companies, but also not for profit organizations or community groups. So we bring that talent in post-secondary institutions together with with industry uh, to develop projects collaborative projects with which both address specific issues in industry or or by these um, not-for-profit organizations while also advancing research goals so we have been um, we are very very focused on driving innovation we do that by matching the expertise that's in Canadian institutions, post-secondary institutions, with the needs of the Canadian economy more broadly. That's kind of the simplest way uh, to describe it. Next slide, please. Um, we do this by uh, virtue of several different programs that we run. Hopefully you have heard uh, some of them. But at the core, all of the programs still maintain, are, are still remain true to that principle of matching the talent and the expertise that we have in post-secondary institutions with the, the, the broader innovation needs of, of the economy. So all of our programs, while there are differences, uh, and I'll walk you through some of those and in terms of who they're targeted to and, and some of the specifics of the actual programs themselves, they're all fundamentally based on that principle and there are a number of shared objectives um, so definitely, uh, we, re we remain focused on high quality research, all of the research programs, projects, pardon me, that are approved through MyTex go through a process of peer review to make sure that they are, uh, you know, meeting a high academic standard. That's one of our marks of quality of our programming that differentiates us from almost any other kind of matching or um, sort of internship and fellowship programs. Um, we do help institutions attract funding um, because we have a cost sharing model. Uh, we are funded primarily by the federal government of Canada, but we also have funding from across the country in terms of provincial governments. And then we also um, uh, leverage funding by the partners on individual projects that, that we work with. We also stimulate international research collaboration. So there are, are ways through my tax to collaborate with international partners, both um, on the industry side as well as on the academic side. Um, we are focused on increasing professional opportunities for students and researchers. 
um, we provide um, flexible and collaborative research initiatives and we really do try to be as flexible as possible um, in our programming and I'll, you'll, you'll see some of that as I walk through the details of the programs. And one important thing to point out is that um, we support all disciplines. We started out, it's true, many, many, many years ago, over 20 years ago now, um, with a focus on STEM disciplines. And, and um, so many people still kind of associate us with that. But in fact, for many years now, we have been open to all disciplines. Uh, so across the STEM field, social sciences and humanities as well. The other thing I'll say quickly before we move on to the next slide and we start getting into some of the more specifics around the programs is that um, our, the way we deliver our programs um, is also quite unique. We have a quite unique <laughs> business model, I would say. Um, and we work through a staff or a team of uh, what we call business development um, staff members. And they are the folks, and actually many, many, many of them are PhD holders, so they're very familiar with, you know, the academic sort of world academic system and also um, research, academic research. But they're the ones that are out there making those connections between academics and, and private sector and or not-for-profit organizations. Um, so I'm, I'm going to mention that here at the end of the presentation, there's a link where uh, you can connect actually with a local business development person in your area if, you, if you've got sort of specific project ideas in mind or, or potential opportunities. Uh, they are distributed across the country, they are active in every province across the country. Okay, next slide. So. Um, <laughs> This is this is now we're going to get started. We're going to get uh, started on naming all of our programs, and you know maybe this will just be uh, I don't know an alphabet soup at the end. But uh, I'll try to to explain some of the differences in our programs. So the four that we really wanted to highlight today because of their relevance, particularly to this group, um, are Accelerate, Elevate, our Business Strategy Internship, and our Canadian Science Policy Fellowship. Um, so we'll start by looking at. Uh, accelerate and we can go to the next slide Michelle um, and this one is sort of our kind of our foundation it's the core it's kind of our flagship program and this is um, applied research collaborations between researchers and Canadian and international companies and not-for-profit organizations so so this is really the core of all of our of all of our programs but this is this is the foundational piece um, it's open to academic institutions right across the country, like I said, in every province. Now we're working also um, uh, in the Yukon as well, which is exciting. Um, and the way this program works is, is it's based on internship modules or internship units, as we call them, of four to six months. So one internship is uh, four to six months in length. Um, again, open to all academic disciplines. The, this is not a competitive process. These applications come in on a rolling basis so that you, uh, an application to accelerate can come in pretty much at any point in the year. The idea of the module or the internship unit is that we can support projects that have, you know, on one collaborative project, there is one intern. We can do a project where there's two interns, we can do four interns, they can be there at the same time, they can be there sequentially. So this is some of the flexibility that I was talking about in terms of our programming. We, you can kind of stack these units or stretch them out um, depending on the needs of the project. Next slide, please. Um, so just some, some, some details slash stats on, on Accelerate. Um, the eligibility actually spans college student level right up to postdocs. So it's college students, undergrads, grads, and postdocs. Uh, some of those eligibilities are newer than others. Traditionally, we have focused on the PhD and postdoc level uh, within the Accelerate program. Uh, and recently we've expanded that to really cover the full spectrum of, of students in post-secondary education. Um, we have small and large scale projects. Some of them are, again, really interesting because they can be multidisciplinary. So you can bring in actually students and, and professors from, from 
different uh, faculties within an institution, different dis disciplines. The funding for a given project, like I say, if it's one unit, it's it's 15, it can be 15,000, but you can, depending on how many internships you actually need within a given project, those, they can be, sometimes we have over 100 internships, for example, on a given project, so those projects can get quite large. We have a very high uh, application success rate, and that is due largely to that network of business development officers that we have across the country, because we don't kind of open a call and sit back and kind of wait for things to roll in and cross our fingers. Our, our business development folks are out there in the market sitting down with partners around the table and building projects that are mutually beneficial. Uh, and so by the time you know they, they, you get to the stage where you have a fully completed application, you, your chances of, of success are so high because you've worked really closely with our BD team. Um, our application process is relatively simple. Um, we, uh, even with our peer review process, we um, get decisions back uh, on project applications between in a period of time between six and eight weeks. Um, and interestingly, uh, both domestic students and international students are eligible to participate in Accelerate. So if you're a graduate student here on a study permit, um, you are still eligible to participate in our Accelerate program. Um, next slide, please. So business strategy internships. Um, this is this one is is a relatively new initiative for my tax. We actually launched it last year, um, sort of <laughs> after the, the onset of the pandemic. Um, and the idea it, again, it's very similar. It's still based on uh, it's still an internship program. It's still based on matching the needs of industry with the expertise that's in post secondary education. But these projects, rather than being focused sort of on the uh, R&D or the applied research side of innovation. These ones are really designed more to help a company with kind of the business end of innovation, right? So innovation is more than invention. It's how do you get things to market? How do you how do you get them adopted? Um, what do you need to think about in terms of a successful business strategy to get your, you know, your product or your methodology out uh, successfully into the marketplace? So these internships um, are really focused more at kind of that end of the spectrum, but still very similar. Uh, the award value is between 10 and 15,000 per four month unit. So we still have that unit based approach. Um, it's open to businesses and eligible not for profit organizations. Uh, we had a lot of uptake from small and medium sized companies last year. A partner, so the, the, the host company will pay 50% of the overall cost. This one also runs on an, uh, an open application cycle. So applications are accepted at any time. And again, you can build a, a BSI project for more than one student and more than one internship unit. Eligibility again, open from college student right through to the postdoc level. Um, next slide, please. Elevate, okay. This one is, um, you can go right to the next slide. Yeah, this is a program that really is targeted specifically to postdocs. Um, and again, it is a, it's a fellowship model. Um, so this one is for postdoctoral researchers to work in a sort of in a longer term kind of arrangement with the partner host organization. So an Elevate Fellowship is a two year collaboration. Um, again, open to all academic disciplines. These ones are, while they're still focused on the research end of the spectrum, these are also really focused also on research management within, um, within the host organization. So we actually provide, um, this Elevate is unique and, and a bit different from Accelerate in that there's actually a customized training program that accompanies an Elevate fellow while they're doing their fellowship. And Valentina will get into some details around that training program in the second part of the presentation. Um, but it is really a distinguishing factor for Elevate. Um, this one is um, a competitive process. So this one, there are specific calls that are issued um, and applications um, are adjudicated through, through our, our uh, research process. Um, next slide, please. So because it's a longer term 
placement than an accelerate um, the value of the awards are a bit higher um, so we have uh, the the salary slash stipend for a fellow is 55,000 per year over two years there is also the availability of some some additional research funding five thousand dollars per year over the two years and then there's um, the value of the training program that I mentioned um, so the bottom part of the slide is just sort of how that that cost sharing works so 30,000 of the overall 60,000 will come from the host organization and the rest comes through my tax funding um, next slide please and the last one, which um, is also of, of interest to, the, to this group, uh, is the Canadian Science Policy Fellowship Program. This one is a little bit unique. Um, it's a really great program, and it's still, you know, matching the talent that, that's coming uh, through and out of our post-secondary institutions. But instead of matching that with the private sector or not-for-profit organizations, in this case, we're matching that with government departments. So for any um, scholars, PhD holders who have an interest in bringing their sort of expertise and their science into the public se sector to basically, you know, improve our capacity to make evidence uh, informed decisions and evidence informed policies. This is a really great program. It's modeled on the AAAS program in the United States that's been running for over 30 years, if any of you are familiar with that. Um, our program has been running now for four or five years, <laughs> five years actually now. Um, so we embed academic researchers who are PhD holders in the public sector for a year. Um, so we run, again, we run a competition, we run a call and we do a, a matching exercise to place the candidates with their host government departments. Um, and we've had incredible success with this over the over the initial five years, and we've had some really stellar candidates who've come in and, and um, been placed with Canadian government departments, and a number of them are still actually working in government and or in, in not for profit organizations, but still with a very much a science policy focus. So this one is open to um, PhD holders. So it, it's definitely, I would say, probably the, the largest group of uh, participants is from the postdoc crowd. It's also open to academics. So if you're a, a faculty member at an institution, you are also eligible to participate in the, in the CSPF program. Um, and in this program as well, uh, we also, MyTax provides again, a customized training program to help build the capacity of those fellows, uh, uh, specifically in uh, policy making um, and and helping to bridge the world the two worlds of sort of academia and and uh, inside government because they are quite different in many ways. Um, so that's actually a nice segue into Valentina's part of the presentation, who's going to talk about um, our training offerings at MyTax. So Valentina, over to you. Amazing. Thank you, Gail. Sorry if I, I have to monitor, so sometimes I, I have to, you know, turn my face. Uh, thank you so much. And hello, everyone. My name is Valentina Carnevali, pronouns she, her. And I work at MyTax as a program analyst in the programs department. And I will be presenting you on the MyTax new curriculum and training offerings. And this is an exciting opportunity to also announce that the new curriculum will go live on October the 4th. So before I dive in and showcase my tax course offering, I would like to start by providing you with some background and context so you understand what we are envisioning to accomplish with this new curriculum. First of all, we wanted to offer training and networks that complement your postdoc or programs experience that enables you to become high functioning actors of the Canadian innovation ecosystem. Keeping in mind what Gail mentioned before, increasing professional opportunities for postdocs and researchers is one of my tax objectives. We want to build participant awareness on truth and reconciliation, as well as EDI, and by providing our learners with tools needed to break down cultural barriers and foster diverse, inclusive workplace. 
to provide a safe learning environment where inclusive language and diverse images are embedded in the course content, to also offer a learner central virtual delivery format for participants who will otherwise face social, structural, and physical barriers through in-person workshop facilitation. Also to provide our participants with professional skills development training that enables the successful mobilization of their knowledge into the economy. And lastly, to provide a learner-centered and mother training opportunities to our postdocs, fellows and interns, all in line with the best practices of the learner industry. Next slide, please. Okay, so my text initiated a project to transform our curriculum in a, into a modern, scalable, and learner center offering with the goal of improving the employability of MITEX participants, researchers, and postdocs in their respective fields. This project was initially launched in response to recommendation by an external review panel calling for improved alignment of MITEX professional development workshops with our work integrated learning opportunities. Some of the recommendations are summarized as follow. First, to align and consolidate competency areas under six main categories, including professional and career fundamentals, interpersonal skills, communication, leadership and management, and lastly, entrepreneurialism. Second, to provide relevant learner center content that reflects and that can be applied to postdocs, program interns and fellow situation, level and context. Also to identify appropriate topic titles that match industry naming conventions and which reflect learning outcomes for my tax curriculum. And lastly, to develop content and materials and activities as well to reflect learning objectives, identified gap and future opportunities, incorporating reconciliation, equity, diversity, and inclusion in my tax curriculum. As you can see, this was identified as a tremendous opportunity for MITEX to renew, modernize, and launch a fully rebranded curriculum offering for our learners and program participants that is rooted in a learner-centric approach with a common MITEX learner journey. Next slide, please. Okay, so now let me summarize uh, our inclusion and reconciliation approach. In the process of curriculum design, EDI and reconciliation are embedded into the storyboarding, writing, deployment, and evaluation of each of the courses. In addition to incorporating truth and reconciliation and EDI modules, the new MITEX curriculum will embed inclusive language, accessible fonts and colors, and graphics and images that reflect the diversity of our postdocs, learners, and program participants. Our blended approach reduces barriers of participation by making our courses accessible for rural interns and fellows, single parents, people with disabilities, etc. We're also recruiting more facilitators with diverse backgrounds to facilitate our new curriculum. Land acknowledgement and handbooks are provided in addition to the e-learning experience. The content is tailored to all the disciplines, and we're also including enhancement into our training portal Edge, that I will be talking about that later on, uh, by adding supporting icons for easy accessibility, central location for supplementary documentation and resources, course transcript, as well as video closed uh, captions in both languages, English and French, and of course, the self-paced journey. Next slide, please. Okay, so this slide is tricky because I have some animations, Michelle. Uh, I'll let you know when to click. So finally, I present you the MITEX new curriculum that as I was saying in the first slide, uh, will go live on October the 4th. As you can see here, we have a combo of self-paced e-learning units that are color-coded in green with a group of facilitated sessions color-coded in blue. You won't need to follow a specific journey path, which means that you can just select and self-enroll into the courses that you would like to strengthen your skills. So now let me show you how this is set up in the portal. Now it's time to click. <laughs> 
Awesome. So as you can see here, uh, we have configured all of these courses into course bundles per topic. So on each course bundle, you will have access to the online course and instructor led course or as we call it, facilitated sessions. So keep in mind that the online portion is a prerequisite for you to be eligible to participate in a facilitated session. Another click. And I'm gonna take as an example, the networking skills course bundle. As I was saying, in each of these course bundles, you can see that a little icon with the number two, that means that there are two courses inside that course bundle. First, we have this online portion. In this case, we have advanced your reach. And you are, once you enroll to this course bundle, you are more than welcome to start your journey by completing this online course. Uh, after you have completed the online portion, you are able and eligible to self-enroll into the facilitated session. In this case, the name of that course is Building Your Project Network Map. So the facilitated session is an opportunity for you to apply your learning with practical exercises. Our facilitators will provide feedback, clarify questions, moderate conversations, and make sure that the learning outcomes are met. Next slide, please. All right, so as Gail was explaining before, our Elevate program is a two-year fellowship where the training component is required as part of their fellowship experience. Elevate fellows are invited to participate in the courses that are listed on this slide, following that specific journey path. Given that this program is cohort-based, fellows will have several opportunities for networking with their peers. They will start with the welcome to elevate an online session followed by the facilitated session. And as you can see here, uh, since it's a two year program, we decided also to break down into in two years, all that training experience. At the end of uh, the, this Elevate program, the fellows are invited to participate in a final event where they will present on their research projects to their peers, facilitators, and other special guests. Next slide, please. All right, so now it's time to talk about the training opportunities that we have available to our Canadian Science Policy Fellows. This is a one year fellowship and such as Elevate is also cohort based, where the training component is tied to their program journey. Fellows here are invited to participate in all the activities that are listed on this slide, starting in October with an orientation where topics such as science diplomacy, science communication, and evidence-based decision-making will be covered. Uh, the training is followed by a group of virtual facilitated sessions, and we also encourage the fellows to participate in the Canadian Science Policy Conference that is offered yearly. And as you can see, there is a break uh, in between December and July activities, and that's a period where we invite the fellows to also enforce other skills by attending our training offering. Next slide, please. Great. So you probably wonder how you can register into all these amazing courses. And as I was saying before, on October the 4th is when you will have access to the new curriculum. However, I will take a couple minutes to explain how you can access into our training portal Edge. Uh, click. <laughs> we have animations on this slide as well. Awesome. So Edge is one of the many acronyms we we have here at MyTax, and it stands for Education, Development, Growth, and Engagement. We manage all the registrations of our learners and program participants into the system through this website, edgereg.mytax.ca. Uh, as you can see, you will have to enter all those required fields from the registration form and confirm your email and password. Once you have completed the registration process, you will have access in into our portal, where you will have all of our professional development offering available in your dashboard with the option to self-enroll into the core bundles and start participating in training courses and facilitated sessions. If you're part of a MyTax program, you will have access to that specific program curriculum. Uh, if you can click, Michelle, please. 
there's another animation, click again. And this is a view of the dashboard. Uh, keep in mind that this is my account and I'm an admin user, so that's why I have access to all the different programs. But as I was saying, depending on your program affiliation, you will have access to that specific curriculum. So that's all from me. I hope you participate in our new courses starting October the 4th. Thank you so much for your attention. And next slide. Thanks also to our funding partners. And we are going to open the floor for some questions and answers. And I'd my colleagues, uh, Gail and Michelle, to also provide support answering these questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Valentina, Gail, and Michelle, for the very informative presentation. It's always great to learn about the latest programs and latest uh, like the plans that might tax. Uh, uh, so the floor is open for the questions. Uh, I already received one question, but I think it was directed uh, to me, but I can read it for you. So the question is, is Canadian Science Policy Fellowship open for all national and international applicants? Sorry, had trouble getting my video back on. Uh, I can take that one. Uh, so right now, um, the the Canadian Science Policy Fellowship Program is is only open to um, Canadian citizens, um, and that is because largely because we are placing when we place a fellow in a government department, um, the government department effectively becomes the employer and the fellow becomes the employee. Um, so we have to basically comply with um, sort of the government. Oh, uh, is there any perspective that it would change in the future or? Um, I don't really have a crystal ball, yeah. but, <laughs> um, but what I would say is, so that program is, like I said, it's in year five. Um, it's not a huge program. So, you know, we we run at about 20-ish fellows per year. It's a fairly selective program. Um, so we're sort of constantly looking at how it's running, what we're learning. I mean, we've been learning a lot over the, the first five years of the program. Um, so I, I will say the program will likely evolve in some ways. I just don't exactly in what ways it I think that's Fair. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. So is there any questions from audience? If so, please either raise your hand or unmute yourself to ask the question. I actually received two other questions in the meantime to see if there is anyone else to ask the question. So one question was about the eligibility period for postdocs. So for instance, uh, Tri-Council has put like, I think, I'm not sure if it's more for the Tri-Council side or the universities, but there is a like five or six years of eligibility if you are postdocs and after that they don't count you as a postdoc. Now, since the industry is involved in these fellowships, does it change the scenario? Is that completely different from my tax? I can take that one. Uh, generally, um, it's aligned with the tri-councils. Tri the exception to the rule is for our CSPF program because we're attracting both faculty potentially as well as people who have been in industry and are interested in going back into um, an opportunity to work in potentially government and inform policy um, evidence uh, informed policies, uh, they, uh, the eligibility is a bit more um, comprehensive and not aligned with the tri-councils, but for our other programming, it is, it's five years. Oh, okay. Thank you. And my second they received was from, uh, about the business strategy internship. So I think that Gail mentioned that it's open to college and uh, all the way to the postdocs. So, uh what does it mean by college like the is that college students or any type of trainee can take advantage of it let's say that there is employee in the college and they want to take advantage of this this internship is that open for those uh like the people as well or they have to be the students do you want to take that one too michelle 
Sure. Can you just repeat the question so I'm clear on, on what it is? Oh, yes. Uh, so the question is about the business strategy internship. And based on what was mentioned, it's open to from college to, to, to postdocs. So uh, my question for college, uh, is that for college students or even the co college being introduced by college as an intern, are they allowed to take advantage of this program? Primarily on college and so not so much employees, but that's an interesting question. As Gail has mentioned, um, we ran that pilot first year just academic, and we've learned a lot. We've changed the capabilities and broadened them for the second year, including eligibility of colleges. Uh, to date, we haven't had a circumstance where an employee at a college would be interested in participating, but that's something I can take away to discuss internally that that may arise. And I don't see why we would um, not at least assess that internally. But for right now, it's uh, college students. Oh, I understand. Thank you very much. So any questions from our audience? I am trying to see if there is any hands here. Uh, well, perhaps in, in the... Uh, Again, I'm trying, I received a couple of questions before the session set to, to our speaker. So um, from day we had, first day of fall, we had the meetings with all the postdoctoral associations in Canada. And uh, we were talking about the, the rights of the postdocs, about the, the standards that why universities are, for instance, paying postdocs, I don't know, 30K, 40K, or something like that, or 50K, it depends. So one of the thing was that the tri-council funding agencies will kind of set, the, has, has set the standard there. So the universities technically, they do not go over that, even though nothing is like the set as a rule, but it makes sense that if the tri-council is not paying say over 45K, uh, the universities will not go over it. But um, my question is about the, the, the my tax, is there any, uh, like the limitation, is there any standard that you have set? I, I understood that you have accelerate, you have uh, elevate, and each of them has its own like the contribution from the industry and the university side. But is there a, anything in the perspective of my tax that uh, you want to push it and kind of encourage the universities to increase that standards for the the postdocs? Considering that the postdocs are HQPs, are highly qualified personnel of like Canada, and uh, obviously when you compare the rights and the benefits and even the salary of a postdoc compared to a junior faculty, there is a huge gap and the person is not receiving what a junior faculty is receiving in the beginning of the path. So, so this was a question that was raised and it's more about the, the right of the postdocs. So I want to see that what's your standpoint on this topic. That's a very good question. Should I jump in Michelle or? Yeah, I'll probably add to whatever you have to say. I have a couple of thoughts. Do you want to start then? Ah, okay. Sure. Um, we, we are aware, and I think we've always defer, and we understand the disparity actually across the board on this, and it is problematic to say the least. Yeah. I think we can all agree. Um, and I would tie it back to the the work that we've prioritized over the last couple of years and acknowledging, you know, the equity, diversity, and inclusion perspective to our programming, and then specifically that different groups are touched differently. So one size fits all model is probably not the best approach given the kind of challenges that different groups experience, different participants experience. So I would say on our end, we haven't taken a firm stance on it, but it's something that is probably gonna be folded in to hire a new vice president of equity diversity to be looking at uh, gaps in our policies and you know you know how inclusive our programming is and doing some work with regards to some of the challenges that the postdoc community is facing and and beyond like all my, ta my tax participants really and so i think that's something for myself, we'll flag definitely back and will come as part of that discussion. So no imminent act, I would say, on our part until we do that broader assessment um, to understand the 
yeah, the, these problematic issues. And I think that uh, that's definitely one that I will add to the list because I am aware of it, but we've just hired uh, this new person and they've got some big shoes to fill. It's a big mandate. So I don't know if Gail, if you wanted to add to that. Yeah, not too much. I mean, I would underscore the same thing. We are aware of a number of the issues um, and it's, we, you know, I would say we're fully cognizant of the fact that the landscape for, for postdoctoral scholars across the country is a bit challenging in a number of ways. Um, you know, CAPS has done some great work over the last number of years to address, you know, a, a number of different issues, you know, employment status, insurance, and um, salary levels. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a very, very tricky landscape for sure. Um, and uh, like Michelle said, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, still work to do on that front, but, um, but it's, yeah, it's, you know, uh, we think our programs offer particularly Elevate. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that is a program that is very strictly targeted to postdocs. Um, and that offers a salary of up to 55,000 per year, um, plus the, the research funding. Um, so, you know, it's, um, that that's where we that's where we sit now um but yeah we totally recognize this is a this is a challenging a challenging landscape to navigate absolutely no that that is great to know that my tax is uh, about it to have the vice president of edi this is when we hope that with the help of tri council my tax and all the agencies in canada we can set the higher standards that encourage universities to uh, at least if they are funding their postdocs internally, it would be something that uh, really like that, that deserving for, for, for our postdocs in Canada. But thank you very much. We have two hands raised here. The first one is Ville Mike, please. Yes, hi. Thank you, everybody, for this talk. I just wanted to sort of do a shout out uh, to the MyTex um, Foundation because I've been a fellow before. Um, and it really helped me when I was transitioning from a European system to uh, a Canadian system, because in the European system where I did my, my, uh, my PhD, there were no fellowships uh, given. So I was having an extremely hard time uh, competing for fellowships here in Canada. And so one of the opportunities that MyTech offered was, um, well, getting a fellowship for something that wasn't requiring uh, previous fellowships. And this actually helped me enter more competitively into a Canadian um, yeah, uh, landscape and getting other fellowships. So it helped me. And uh, this, is an, this is also true for, for people that are struggling with, for example, not being allowed to apply because they don't have citizenship or permanent residency. Um, so I just wanted to add to that. Can I just comment on that? First of all, thank you for that comment. Um, that's a really good point. And that's something that we've actually heard um, from other participants in our programming too. Um, uh, and that I would say that also we, we see that kind of um, almost sort of like foot in the door to that fellowship world. Uh, we see that success in others as well. And we also actually see um, for new faculty who are involved on the faculty side in terms of being supervisors, um, for on the projects where the students are actually, or the uh, students or postdocs are doing the fellowship, there, there's always an academic supervisor. Um, and we've also heard from the academic point of view too, right? So to, to access my tax funding can help them endorse to, to uh, future funding from, from the granting councils down the road. So that's a very good point. Thank you for bringing that up. All right, thank you. So the next question is Michelle, please. Address, thank you for your question. Um, and Michelle and Gail for your comments on, on the question and Vitamake for, for adding to it. Um, so it's the same sort of topic. And I just wanted to uh, firstly acknowledge my tax for being so open to looking at these issues and seeing how you can actually stand apart. Um, of the current sort of standards uh, that's so promising. And, um, you know, and, and I know how proactive my tax has been in, in, in growing and, um, and looking at these uh, EDI issues. Um, the point I wanted to raise is with regards to, it's been sort of touched on, but just maybe highlighting um, 
an age gap. So some postdocs are nearing not only 40s, but 50s. Um, and many of them are having, you know, they'll have supervisors that are, you know, new and emerging researchers um, that are faculty, and they're paid in the hundred thousands. And, and uh, you know, postdocs are at the 40,000 mark, even though they have more experience than their own supervisor. It's something to consider, I think, somewhere um, in, in the factors, um, you know, when, when looking at, at EDI issues. Um, I think that was, yeah, that's my point. Just I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Michelle. If, if there is any comment from the, the speakers, if not, uh, I've got two more questions. Oh, we have Michelle there. No, I, I thank you for that insight. And I'm, I'm taking notes and just kind of to process and take back and see how it fits into the broader work we're doing with EDI. So, so thanks for that, Michelle. All right. Thanks for being open, Michelle. Thank you very much, Michelle. So I'm, I'm receiving actually the questions in as direct message to myself. So I will encourage everyone just to write it in the chat. I can't uh, navigate all of them at the same time, but uh, I can just read a couple of them that I'm receiving that in direct message. So one of the questions was about, um, uh, said that I might have missed an information. Are the MyTax courses also offered to postdoc not supporting by MyTax programs? Yeah, and the short answer is yes. All these courses are available to all of our postdocs. Uh, not, not, you don't necessarily need to be part of a MyTex program. You are eligible to participate. I see. Wonderful. The next question is that I did my PhD five years ago. Am I eligible for postdoc under MyTex? Like right. De dependent on the program. Um, so some of the programs that were matched in the accelerate elevate within five years are still eligible beyond that, not but for CSPF, it, it, it's open. So there's not that cap at the five year mark. I understand. Thank you. And the other question is Oh, okay. I think that it's not related to my tax. Yeah, it's about for myself. Uh, so is there any other questions from the, the audience? If there is no other questions, please join me to thank our speakers from my tax. We really appreciate your presence and the, the great talk that you did for our audience. And uh, we look forward to collaborate more with uh, MyTax as like, the Canadian Association of Postdoctoral Scholars. We have uh, uh, the, the change that we had in our association was uh, we are backbone with our uh, like the postdoctoral associations in, across Canada. So we think that we have a stronger voice. We are really uh, like the we feel like as a very larger community so that would help us to understand more concerns of the postdocs and we would love to share some of the, those with with my tax and try agencies and to get the insight from your side to hopefully provide some better environment for our postdocs in canada uh, but thank you again everyone thanks to all the speakers and uh, we appreciate your presence well thank you again for for inviting us to this uh, we've had a we've had a pretty uh, warm relationship with CAPS over a number of years, um, so we're happy to keep that dialogue open, and uh, it's great that you think of my tax for events like these where you're convening folks, um, so thank you very much, and um, we'll look forward to um, further interactions with you down the road. For sure. Thanks a lot, and have a good rest of the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. All right. So... Uh session is supposed to be started like in a couple of minutes. Our next session, I am going to